Hello everyone and welcome back. In the last episode, we learned about synaptic transmission. In this episode, we are going to meet some neurotransmitters. First, we are going to learn about all the families of the neurotransmitters. Then, we will meet our old friend acetylcholine and meet some new friends in the next part. In this episode, we will first define what are neurotransmitters, then have an overview of neurotransmitters. Their characteristics include their synthesis pathways, their method of transportation, their receptors, their disposal mechanisms, their distribution in the human body, and their functions. In this episode, we are going to focus on acetylcholine and take a look at the rest of the neurotransmitters in the next episode. This episode requires basic knowledge of organic chemistry, especially functional groups including hydroxyl, carboxyl, amine groups, methyl groups, and acetyl groups. Here are the illustrations of some of the more important groups. This is a hydroxyl group, namely an oxygen atom plus a hydrogen atom. This is the carboxyl group, namely COOH. It is sometimes presented in the form of its anion, COO-. The amine group is NH2. It is sometimes presented in its cation form, NH3+. This is an acetyl group. It is CH3COO. It is also recommended that the notations used in organic chemistry are known for this episode. First and foremost, how were neurotransmitters discovered? They were discovered by a scientist called Otto Lowy. He discovered it, believe it or not, in the heart of frogs. The first neurotransmitter discovered was acetylcholine. It was discovered at the end of the vagus nerve, which innervated the heart. The vagus nerve connected to the heart. When the vagus nerve is activated, the heart's beating becomes slower. Otto Lowy took a frog heart from its body. The heart did not directly stop beating. So he first stimulated the vagus nerve using an electrode. Then the heart rate slows down. Lowy then removes some fluid sample from the heart. Then he takes another heart. This heart is beating at a normal rate. He adds the fluid sample to this recipient heart that is beating normally. Then miraculously, the heart rate also slows. This is because the fluid sample that Otto Lowy removed contains some acetylcholine from the donor heart. Then as it is applied to the recipient heart, the heart rate slows because of the stimulation of acetylcholine that exists in the fluid. This was how acetylcholine was discovered, and the chemical transmission of nervous signals were proved. What is a neurotransmitter? Well, it must satisfy three conditions. Firstly, the molecule must be synthesized and stored in the presynaptic neuron. Secondly, it must be released by the presynaptic axon terminal upon stimulation. And the third condition is, when experimentally applied, the molecule must cause a postsynaptic response that is similar to the innate response. Usually, we say that one neuron only has one type of neurotransmitter. This is called Dale's principle. However, there are some violations, especially in neurons that use neuropeptides. Certain neurons that use neuropeptides also have a small molecule neurotransmitters as its transmitter. Because of Dale's principle, we are able to name neurons according to the type of neurotransmitter that they use. We call these kinds of neurons what-ergic neurons. For example, neurons that use acetylcholine are called cholinergic. Neurons that use GABA are called GABAergic. Neurons that use glutamate are called glutamatergic, etc. Neurotransmitters can be classified in different ways. Firstly, we can classify them into small molecules and neuropeptides. We have already talked about this in the past episode. Let's take a look more closely. Small molecule neurotransmitters have many different subtypes. For example, amino acids. Amino acids are chemicals that have both the amino group and the carboxyl group. Therefore, they both have amino and acid properties. These include glycine, glutamine, and GABA. 
Glycine and glutamine are both two of the 20 amino acids that are used to make proteins, while GABA is not. The second type is monoamines. These include dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, serotonin, histamine, and some others. The third type are other molecules, including acetylcholine and ATP. There are some special neurotransmitters that are small molecules. However, they do not exactly conform to the definition that we've given above. These include nitrogen monoxide and endocannabinoids. They are a type of special neurotransmitters. On the other hand, in neuropeptides, we have NPY, substance P, enkephalins, CCK, VIP, and many other neuropeptides. Neural peptides can be very diverse. Firstly, they can vary in length. Secondly, they are peptides and made of amino acid sequences. At each position, there are 20 possible amino acids. Therefore, neuropeptides can be very different from one another. Besides from the classification of small molecules and neuropeptides, we can also classify them according to excitatory and inhibitory. Excitatory neurotransmitters cause an excitation in the postsynaptic neuron, or a depolarization, in other words. Inhibitory neurotransmitters cause a hyperpolarization, or we should say inhibition. Some neurotransmitters can both be excitatory and inhibitory depending on the receptor on the postsynaptic cell. Question time. Try and classify what class of neurotransmitters these belong to. A small hint is that the arginine, proline, lysine, proline, glutamine that are written below A are all the names of amino acids. So molecule A is a neuropeptide because it is a sequence of amino acids. Molecule B is a small molecule neurotransmitter. In fact, it is GABA, which we have mentioned earlier. We can easily see they're different from their size. The neuropeptide is very large and has great molecular mass, while the small molecule GABA is very small. Now try to classify these neurotransmitters into excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters. A, a transmitter that opens a ligand-gated cation channel. B, a transmitter that opens a chlorine channel. C, a transmitter that activates a G protein that, in turn, opens a G protein gated potassium channel. D, a transmitter that activates GS, which increases the activity of PKA. A is an excitatory neurotransmitter because it opens cation channels. B is inhibitory because it opens chlorine channels. C is inhibitory because it opens potassium channels. And D is likely excitatory because it activates a GS protein. Neurotransmitters have many characteristics that are worth learning about. Firstly, on the chemical perspective, we can learn about its synthesized pathway, its transportation. This includes axonic transport, which is the transport of neuropeptides from the soma to the axon terminal. And we also have co- and counter-transport. This is transport at the axon terminal. When neurotransmitters are transported from outside the cell to inside the cell, there is usually co-transport. For example here, glutamate is co-transported with sodium ions. When neurotransmitters are transported into the vesicle from the axon terminal, there is usually counter-transport. Glutamate is moved into the vesicle, while protons are moved out of the vesicle. This makes use of the high concentration of protons inside the vesicle. This high concentration is created by ATP ases, which are proton pumps. These proton pumps pump a lot of protons into the vesicle and facilitates counter-transport. We can also learn about the types of receptors. We have two types, ligand-gated ion channels and GPCRs. These are sometimes also called ionotropic receptors and metabotropic receptors. These are some examples of ionotropic receptors. Usually, these receptors are made of many single monomers. For example, we have pentamers, tetramers, and trimers, depending on the type of receptor. This is an illustration of a metabotropic receptor. A GPCR 
is usually a protein with seven transmembrane segments, and it usually acts in monomers. Sometimes it also forms dimers, but it is not that necessary. We can also learn about the agonists and antagonists of receptors. Agonists are chemicals that have similar functions to the neurotransmitter. It activates the receptor just like the neurotransmitter. On the other hand, antagonists have opposite function to the neurotransmitters. It inhibits the receptor, acting against the neurotransmitter. We can learn about what kinds of chemicals are the agonists and antagonists of certain receptors. We can also learn about how these neurotransmitters are reuptaked or degraded enzymatically. From the functional perspective, we can learn about the distribution of the neurotransmitter in our human body. This can be achieved using a technique called immunocytochemistry. Immunocytochemistry means using the immune system to do some chemistry on the cell. Cyto means cell. Here, we first inject neurotransmitters into an experiment animal. Then the animal will spontaneously produce antibodies for these transmitters. These antibodies can bind to the neurotransmitters wherever they are. Then we tag the antibody with visual markers, for example, stain molecules or fluorescent proteins. After that, we inject these antibodies, these modified antibodies, into the cell that we desire or the tissue that we desire. Then it will automatically bind to the neurotransmitters and will show up in micrographs. We can see them through stains or through fluorescence. After studying the distribution, we can have some information on its functions. What functions does it perform? How does it function in the body? These are the characteristics that we would like to learn about each neurotransmitter. Now, time for meeting an old friend. We talked about acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. This is the whole process of the chemical reactions related to acetylcholine. First, the synthesis. The synthesis of acetylcholine takes place in the cytoplasm of the axon terminal. This is the reaction formula. Acetylcholine is made of an acetyl group attached to a choline group. In the axon terminal, we have acetyl-coenzyme A, acetyl-COA. This provides the acetyl group. We also have freely available choline. They are pieced together into acetylcholine, and the coenzyme A is removed. This process is catalyzed by an enzyme called choline acetyltransferase, or CHAT. CHAT is specific to cholinergic neurons. Only cholinergic neurons express this protein because only they need this protein. So we can use CHAT as a marker for cholinergic neurons. We can use this fact to make these neurons stained or fluorescent. Secondly, we need to transport the acetylcholine into the vesicle. This is achieved using a protein called VACHT, which stands for vesicular ACH transporter. All the proteins named V what 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 T's are vesicular what transporters. After that, we have receptors of acetylcholine on the postsynaptic cell. There are two major types of receptors, nicotinic ACH receptors and muscarinic ACH receptors, abbreviated NACHR and MACHR. NACHR is a type of ion channel. It is made of five subunits. It is made of two alpha subunits, one beta subunit, one gamma subunit, and one delta subunit. Each subunit has four transmembrane segments. The two alpha subunits have a binding site for acetylcholine. If each alpha subunit binds an acetylcholine, then the ion channel opens. This ion channel is excitatory because it allows the inflow of cations. This receptor is called nicotinic because nicotine is an agonist of this channel, which means that nicotine can also open this receptor. Muscarinic ACH receptor has muscarine as its agonist, ergo the name muscarinic. This is a GPCR, a metabotropic receptor. It is inhibitory because the G alpha protein opens potassium channels, and this hyperpolarizes the cell. Finally, we have degradation of acetylcholine. This is the reaction formula. The degradation of acetylcholine is a process of hydrolysis. A molecule of water is added, and acetylcholine 
is broken into two parts. The acetyl group and the choline group are broken off, forming acetic acid and choline. The process is catalyzed by acetylcholine esterase. It is also specific to cholinergic neurons. Finally, after the degradation of acetylcholine, the choline is recycled using choline transporters. The choline goes back into the axon terminal and can be used again to synthesize acetylcholine. Where are acetylcholine distributed? Well, they are distributed in the basal forebrain, in the autonomous nervous system, both the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions, and in alpha motor neurons. We will talk about what basal forebrain and the ANS are in our episode about anatomy overview. We already know what alpha motor neurons may mean, though we have not seen this name before. Alpha motor neurons are the presynaptic neurons at the neuromuscular junction. They are the neurons that form a synapse with the muscle cells directly. A final question for part one of this episode. Please try to explain what effects the application of the following chemicals will have on the human body. A. Curare is an antagonist of NACHR, which are excitatory receptors of ACH in neuromuscular junction. What will the effect of curare be on the human body? B. Atropin is an antagonist of MACHR. One of the locations of expression of MACHR is around the pupil of the eye, where release of acetylcholine would cause constriction of the pupil. What will the effect of atropine be on the eye? Here are the answers. Curare will block NACHR from receiving ACH. It is an antagonist. Therefore, muscles are not able to contract, and they are paralyzed. Therefore, curare is a kind of toxin. In fact, some native people living in Australia put curare on the heads of their arrows in order to paralyze their enemies. Atropine, on the other hand, causes dilation of the pupil, which is the exact opposite to pupillary constriction that is caused by the release of acetylcholine. Therefore, atropine is sometimes used clinically in eye drops to dilate the pupil in ophthalmological examinations. That is all for this episode. In this episode, we learned about neurotransmitters in general and took a detailed look at acetylcholine, our old friend. In the next episode, we are going to meet new friends, namely monoamines, amino acids, neuropeptides, and other special neurotransmitters, and take a look at what diffuse modulatory systems are. Thank you for watching part one of episode six. Looking forward to see you again in the next part.